And in the morning, if there was one thing we covered for sure, it's that there's a lot more data out there than ever before. It comes from more sources than ever before. Potentially more hands are on it than ever before. And some parts of it can be automated. Maybe not taste can be automated, but many other things can be automated. And one of the more effective ways to do this is with visual tools, which move quicker and can scope in more at that time. Jeffrey Hare of Stanford University is here to speak about some of the tools he's seen and I take it developed mm -hmm. to do this kind of interactive data analysis. And the best thing I can do is just turn it over to Jeffrey. Thank hey, you very thank much, you. Sean. Mm -hmm. So I see I'm Jeff Hare. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford University in the computer science department. Uh, but since I'm presenting here at Berkeley today, I hope you won't hold that against me. Um, in my defense, I'll note that I actually spent 10 years with as an undergraduate and graduate student here at Berkeley. And in particular, about half of my coursework was spent in the School of Information. So it's quite a treat to be able to come back today. Um, I'm also partially representing uh, Trifacta Incorporated, a company uh, based in San Francisco, to which I'm a co-founder. And what I want to talk to you today about is really the focus of our research group at Stanford, which is on how do we make interactive tools to really bridge that last gap in helping people connect with their data, understand the patterns, better generate hypotheses, and really get started in the process of data analysis. And so I'd like to start with a question, uh, one that you've probably already considered in various guises uh, throughout uh, this conference. So for example, how much data are we producing? So I got interested in this question, this was obviously a couple years ago, and asking, you know, well, in 2010, how much bytes did we produce? In this case, like, what is like non-duplicated, you know, generated, unique, new, stored information? And I think what's, you know, interesting about this question is not the number, because what's in the number, but really just the process that you go through to try and arrive at an estimate. Like, what is all this data that we're generating? You know, every photograph that you took with a digital camera, every video on YouTube, every song produced and shared, you know, every email, every social and financial transaction that you've engaged in on the web is probably being logged. In addition to all the log files of all the computers across all the world um, and saving their results uh, for further analysis, really a staggering amount of information. And a surprisingly large chunk of it is all about us and our activities. Um, so, in this case, you know, one estimate that was reached up for 2010 was 1,200 exabytes. If you're into exotic units, that's 1.2 zettabytes. Uh, you can go look it up on Wikipedia, that's a real word. Um, but it's a number so large it really staggers the imagination. It's a scale so big that we can't quite fit it in our head. So I tried to make sense of what that number actually is. One um, a quote is that it's over 60 million times the physical holdings of the U.S. Library of Congress. 60 million. Um, but I don't know how big the Library of Congress is. Um, so uh, well, it's also, uh, if you take DVDs, fill them up with data, and stack them to the moon and back, you end up with the number roughly at this level. And if some of you are like big systems people, you may, oh, that's nothing. Well, okay, fine. You know, that's great. You just wait. Um, so this is growing exponentially. And so the point being that even if a tiny percentage of this data is useful to us and better informing you know, everything from government to policy to science to our daily lives, like, we're going to need the tools uh, to be able to work with it and really make it an effective aid to decision making. And so that aim, I was really inspired by also a, a, an iSchool affiliate, uh, Hal Varian, uh, you know, Google's chief economist, who wrote that the ability to understand process, extract value, visualize, and communicate data is hugely important skill in the next decades. Because he argues we essentially free and ubiquitous data, and so the complementary scarce resource is our ability to really make use of it. And so I'm interested in this question of, okay, great, we have this data, we have systems, we even have really interesting algorithms for processing it. How do we really make use of it? So let's just dive right in and look at some data. This is actually, um, uh, if, you're in, uh, if you're a voyeur, uh, you're in luck. Uh, this is my personal Facebook network, uh, circle a couple of years ago. Um, and what you're seeing here is a particular representation called a node link diagram. Here, each circle represents a person, and then these gray edges represent friendship connections on the Facebook service. And then here, the, the circles, the people, have been sized according to a statistic called betweenness centrality, which roughly gives you a sense of how central a person is in that network. <laughs> And how this type of diagram is constructed is, you know, it's one form of visualization technique. The nodes act like charged particles that repel each other. The, the edges act like springs that pull nodes together. And the idea is that in this simulation, it leads to a layout that helps you see something interesting about the structure of the data set. 
And here we immediately see about like three perhaps useful things, perhaps a little bit more if you're trained in social network analysis. We really see three main clusters. So what you're seeing is out to the left, that's actually you know, like a group of undergraduate friends, and the bottom right, that's actually a group of high school friends. And then this giant mass in the middle is all of my colleagues and friends from graduate school and all of my other kind of compatriots in the human computer interaction research field. And so looking at this diagram, you, you, know, you get a sense that, okay, there's this, this substructure, and maybe that's interesting, but you don't really get a sense of what's happening in that giant mass. You know, for those of you familiar with social networks, you might know something about core periphery structure. So it seems denser in the center and you have some loose edges around the side. But that's pretty much all we can glean from this representation. And so one of the most important things to keep in mind when thinking about visualization is that there's not just one representation of the data that then just gives us all the answers, but much more often it's a highly iterative process where we look at the data through various facets, each of which highlights different aspects that we may be interested in. So for example, let's take the same data set and visualize it in an alternative way. Uh, this is using uh, what we call an adjacency matrix or a matrix diagram. In this case, we've really put the edges front and center. So what you're seeing is that each row and each column represent one, a person. And that pers people are duplicated along both the x and y axes. And this creates a grid and then we can just color in a cell when there's an edge between those two people. And we do one other thing that helps us make these diagrams more useful is that we actually run an algorithm called a seriation technique that then sorts those rows and columns in a way that helps revealing clustering structure. In this case, we try and place two people near each other if they're highly connected in the network. They share a lot of friends. I mean, doing so actually reveals some interesting substructure that wasn't apparent in that first view. So in this case, you might notice some different groupings along the diagonal. These actually um, highlight communities that are present within the network. So at the bottom right, we have one of those extreme communities we saw before, and not in the very top left, but in between the next one down, we see one of those other communities. Everything else was, is actually pulling apart that big giant mass of nodes we saw earlier. And actually what it turns out here is that you actually find some different subgroups, including people in the HCI research community, um, other graduate school friends of mine, and it turns out one of those blocks, believe it or not, is uh, people affiliated with the iSchool. Um, and so in this way, we're like, okay, great, we get, you know, almost like spectroscopy, we get more insight into the data through this representation once we learn how to read it. In this case, we see what we see for is a giant hairball actually has really interesting substructure composed of overlapping communities. And at this point, we might stop and say, great, now we, we kind of have a, a general sense of how this data is structured. We might then dive in to look at particular individuals, or we may feel comfortable running various algorithms, for example, to like, if you're at Facebook, maybe to predict and suggest new friends. But I would caution you from doing that right away because one thing that we did was we tried to be clever. We took this data set and we tried to pick the right representation. We also then did this thing about sorting the rows and columns of the matrix to try and show us the structure. And one thing that I can't impress enough is also always try to look at your data in its rawest form. And in this case, if we take the same matrix diagram and just leave it unsorted, we just bring in the data in the order at which it was returned by Facebook, we get a much different picture. In this case, you know, we've kind of lost that clustering structure because we've randomized it, but then we see something else entirely. And what I'll tell you is that the, the way these uh, results are returned is that people are sorted by their Facebook ID, which is basically just a counter on when people join the service. So now let's take a look at this, this diagram. And look, there's this giant white square in the bottom right. And if we were to interpret that literally, what it would say is that none of the newcomers to Facebook are friends with each other. And the question is, do we believe that? And I think if any of you spent time on Facebook, probably have some good evidence that no, like newcomers tend to be friends with each other as well. In fact, maybe on the edge of people providing invites. So this led me to take pause. Like, do I trust this data? Is this data something that we really want to use to, to, to inform decision making? And so I dug deeper and it turns out uh, something, uh, you know, something subtle happened along the way of uh, you know, processing this data. And so I tried to be clever and write a single query to the Facebook system to pull all the data in one shot. Turns out Facebook silently imposes you know, a 5,000 result limit. Um, and so in this case, if I had done it the dumb way and just queried once per friend, I would actually have had the, the entire data set. But in this case, you know, there was a, you know, a limitation on, on how the data was being provided that went unnoticed until like, much further in the process. And so what we see here is a number of different issues coming into play. So one of them, of course, is visualization. So this use of visual representations to help us make sense of data and interactively explore different questions. 
But this example also highlights that you know, visualization is just kind of one tool or one piece of a much larger process that involves you know, questions of how we acquire data, how we clean and integrate multiple data sets, how we engage in modeling, et cetera, all the way through to presentation and dissemination of results. And while it might seem convenient, and many tools often make this assumption, that the process looks something like this, you know, as probably your own experience, and certainly this previous example shows, in reality, it's often much more like this. That you start working with data, you begin to form some questions and some insights, then some representation sends you back to the drawing board as you realize the data quality is insufficient, or you make it all the way to like publishing or presenting your results, and then someone else raises that critical question that challenges a false assumption and then sends you back into this process. So what I'm most fundamentally interested in is figuring out what are the bottlenecks in this process, and given that it's highly iterative and interactive, it requires human judgment and oversight, where do we create the tools to make people more effective in working with their data? And so what I'd like to do in the rest of this talk is just give you some examples of projects we're working on at Stanford that highlight some of the issues we're trying to address up and down this data life cycle. So let's start in the middle with the, you know, this core topic of visualization. And one of the questions that really interests us here is, how about we better support expressive and effective visualization designs? Like, how do we let people, you know, given a data set, you know, create effective representations? How can we let them explore the space and provide a structure for, you know, basically authoring new types of visualization? So here's a quote that really inspired me uh, as we began to ask this question. You know, this is from John Tukey, uh, the famous statistician who also uh, popularized the exploratory data analysis movement. This is an article he wrote over 50 years ago, but I find it almost, if not more valuable today than it was back when it was written. This is just one of many priceless quotes from that, that piece. And here he wrote that today's first task is not to invent entirely new graphical techniques, though these are needed, but rather we need most vitally to recognize and reorganize the essentials of old techniques, to make easy their assembly in new ways and to modify their external appearances to fit the new opportunities. And so I was pondering this along with um, a very talented graduate student of mine, Mike Bostock, and thinking about, well, what does this mean? How do we approach this problem? Given like, the history of visualization, you know, are, what, what does it mean to recognize and reorganize the essential of old techniques? And this led us to a very simple, but it turned out you know, very helpful realization, which is you know, we can think of any graphic and basically as just a composition of a set of very simple data representative marks. And so what you see here on the left is actually a data graphic designed in the 1950s by the designer Will Burton. At the time, like, uh, you know, um, antibiotics were new wonder drugs. And so this was like a published graphic showing the effectiveness of different types of antibiotics um, when applied to different bacteria and cultures. And if we look at this, you know, each, each one of these colored bars actually represents the effectiveness of an antibiotic. There's this colored background which indicates how the bacteria react to a technique called gram staining, which is basically a diagnostic technique you might use to try and figure out what kind of infection you have. But taking this graphic, we actually decompose it into what we thought of basically six statements about data. So three based on, you know, different, um, you know, these kind of radial bar charts. Each one of these is basically a bar representing the effectiveness of a particular antibiotic across a number of bacteria. Then we have two types of marks that are grid lines, both radial and angular. And then finally, this background coloring for gram staining. And so we just thought, well, each one of these is, in some sense, a relatively simple statement about data that's then rendered using some, some simple graphical mark. And so this led us to this you know, postulate that you know, can we reconstruct, maybe not the entire space of visualizations, but a suitable um, and effective subset using the simple language of Marx? And basically, can we construct a language for data visualization that's richly expressive, but also approachable and accessible to a broader audience? And so after we kind of deconstructed a number of examples, we arrived at kind of this eight set of graphical primitives, so like area marks, rectangles, plotting symbols, raster images, paths, which can also you know, be lines or curves or closed shapes like polygons, text, uh, rules, basically like grid lines for convenience, and then these angular arcs. Um, and so the question was, what can we do with all this? And can we build a language um, to really build interesting visualizations using just this as the foundation? And this led to a number of projects, the first of which was a toolkit we released called ProtoViz and was later uh, superseded uh, by its successor, uh, D3, or Data Driven Documents. So here's some examples of some of the, the visualizations we're able to construct with these tools. Um, so some of you may recognize this chart. Um, this is by William Playfair, who's kind of like one of the, the, uh, one of the instigators of modern data visualization techniques. So he operated at an interesting time at history where the rise of both you know, bureaucratic governments and the rise of capitalism led to a new influx of data collection. 
So not unlike what we're experiencing today, you know, well, people talk about all the hype of big data and much of that substantiated, it's also worth pointing out that it's not a new phenomenon. Um, and this was like the, the killer technology of the day, hand-drawn charts based on collected data. So one of the things that we sought to do is like, well, our tool, rather than recreate Excel charts or something like that, should have the expressiveness to be able to recreate these hand-drawn original graphics. In this case, we see kind of an early form of a mashup um, of data. So we see the, the wages of a mechanic uh, plotted uh, on top of the, the, the fluctuating prices of wheat. And then above that, you see the reigning British monarch. So you know who to blame if your bread costs too much. So this is one example that we recreated. I should also note that William Playfair is the inventor of the pie chart. Uh, despite its ubiquity, it actually has a relatively short 200-year history. Going forward, here's another and more exotic visualization. This was uh, Florence Nightingale's coxcomb. And this was meant to uh, depict uh, deaths in the Crimean War. So here you see you know, for each wedge that represents a month within a year, and then the red represents battlefield deaths, black represents other deaths, and blue deaths due to preventable disease. And so you might say, okay, I, you can, it's actually a very small number of, of, of values overall. And the, I, her statistician colleagues actually argued to present this as a clean table. And instead, you know, Florence argued for this more exotic representation, um, thinking that you know, she wanted to affect through the eyes what we failed to convey to the public through their word-proof ears. So in this case, it was intentionally a provocation, right? Um, you know, whether, you know, there, there are uh, critiques you can make in terms of the effectiveness of how well the numbers are communicated in this graph. She wanted to grab people's attention and get them to, to realize the issue at hand. And of course, you know, no toolkit would be complete without the ability to reconstruct what Edward Tufte claimed might possibly be the greatest statistical graphic ever made. I'll let you be the judge. Uh, this is uh, Charles Menard's depiction of Napoleon's ill-fated march on Moscow. And of course, you can here see, you know, actually starting in Central Europe, I believe actually modern uh, Lithuania or Latvia, the army progresses and then, you know, comes back diminished, um, greeted by freezing temperatures. The high point here on the corresponding chart is zero degrees Celsius. And you can see it as the army goes back. So again, these are all recreated with our tools using this basic library of graphical marks. Of course, we also want to support more modern and interactive forms of representation. So that includes familiar graphics like line charts. Here using a technique called overview plus detail where we have this overview and we can drag out a region and then in the big display actually see the, the, the focus data more clearly. And this allows you, know, of course, for interactive exploration. Here's another visualization technique popular for uh, analyzing higher dimensional data. This is called the scatter plot matrix, or SPLOM for short. Um, what you do here is you have a, a data set with multiple variables, and then you just take all pairwise plots as scatter plots, and you just lay them out in this table to try to assess correlations among all the different dimensions in your data set. And so here we have a classic example from statistics, looking at different uh, statistics of uh, different species of plant, in this case iris flowers. We can couple this with interaction techniques. So here's one called brushing and linking, where we drag out a region. And then what we do in this one chart, and we can see how all the corresponding data projects across all the other charts in the display. So in this case, I you know, isolated this one cluster, and I can see where it resides in all the other charts. Of course, I've redundantly encoded with color to make that a bit easier to spot. Um, and then as I drag around, you can see how this you know, selection range projects across all the other dimensions of the data set. And this is useful if you really, if pairwise comparison helps provide insights across all the variables in your data. Here's another technique for um, high dimensional data, a bit more exotic, a bit a little more intimidating at first. Uh, this is called parallel coordinates. And what you're seeing is actually a representation of seven different dimensions within a data table simultaneously. This one's actually about cars. So you see things like the number of cylinders here, the horsepower, the weight, uh, acceleration measured in time from zero to 60 miles per hour. And what we've done is taken each dimension in the data set, plot it as a separate axis, and then for each row in our table, we just connect all the points on the different axes to arrive at this representation. And initially, it can be a bit of a mess, but through interactivity, we can actually start to explore some interesting questions. So for example, what happens with all the heavy cars? So here's all the heavy cars, and we see that they tend to have high horsepower. They tend to you know, be quite good with acceleration, but tend to have horrible mileage, quite surprisingly. Um, but as we brush through, we can actually see different ways in which the data projects, and we can actually add constraints along multiple dimensions. And so this is a way to really try and engage with reasoning with data that may actually reside or have interesting correlations across um, you know, many dimensions within the data set. And of course, there are other interaction techniques we can consider as well, such as the ways in which we rescale or reorder the presentation of axes in the display.
And of course, these are really focusing on tabular data sets. There are many other data types as well, for example, geographic data. So here's like an Albers projection of the United States. And over plotted on top is the, all the different airports sized by their traffic. And then as you mouse over the different points, you see the connections made from the airports to each other. And you might notice that as I get near a point, it gets selected before I even mouse over it. And this is great because some of them are quite small. Um, to know what's happening, there's actually you know, a secret visualization at play as we've constructed what's called a Voronoi diagram so that any time like, we reach a pixel that's closest to a given point, we automatically select that data point. So this is a way in which you can kind of turbocharge the interaction and make things easier to select and explore. You know, networks are another type of data that we care about. Um, this particular uh, visualization shows the structure of a software project. In this case, each node on the outer ring is a particular file of source code uh, within a project. And then the edges here represent dependencies. So does one piece of code depend on what's written in another uh, file? And this, of course, by individually, we can start to see connections of how individual files depend on each other. But we've also intelligently laid out the edges of this graph to try and see more structural connections. So in these spaces actually represent different directories. So there's a hierarchy structure to the project. And then we can see how different modules actually have um, interconnections between them. So if I were to lay out this graph in a more naive way, you can see these connections are much harder to see. Right? We draw the edges directly. But instead, if we route the edges as curved lines that actually respect the underlying hierarchy, in this case, the directory structure of the project, we're able both to see these individual like, item level details while also seeing this global structure within the data set. And then finally, like, no language would be complete without the ability to do things that uh, might be less than good. Um, so for example, you want a language so expressive that you can say bad things in it. English is no exception, of course. Um, but we also want to have an interesting range of expressions. So here's a, a range of animations that we can produce. One is to show you all the different ways that a, a very simple data set might be presented. And also show you the flexibility of this kind of representation of marks and be able to move through all these different views. Um, of course, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using all of these views in your actual analysis, but it does give you a sense sort of the expressive space that these tools can provide. So that was just some examples. Let me go back to the slides. Um, all those examples you saw are actually created with our JavaScript framework D3.js, which stands for Data Driven Documents. Um, and here's some more visualizations that you can create in the system. And again, it's really based on this idea of taking data and mapping it to the visual properties of marks. In the case of D3, these marks are actually just elements in a web page, whether that's HTML or SVG elements to show uh, interactive graphics. And if you're interested, it's actually available as an open source project. You can go download it from GitHub, where you know, it shouldn't be hard to find. Um, in addition, I think the most exciting part is to see how these tools can enable you know, richer forms of visualization out on the web today. So for example, many of you may have used D3 without knowing it. Um, so for example, if you saw the interactive graphics that were published as part of the New York Times election coverage, you probably ran into a D3 chart. Uh, this one was actually done by my student, Mike Bostock, who created D3 and now works at the Times. This shows a decision tree of all the different ways either Obama or, Obama or Romney could take the White House, in this case ordered by the most influential states. And be allowed you to interactively explore you know, different scenarios, but also if you drill down to the bottom right and you see some of these yellow dots, you can also immediately spot all the different ways the Electoral College could have ended up in a tie. Um, we've also seen D3 and, and many other projects. Just one other I'd share with you is from our friends and colleagues at Stamen Design. Um, so you might be wondering where this image is taken from. This is actually the European MTV Music Video Awards. Um, and what you're seeing on all these displays here is actually a live visualization of uh, Twitter response uh, built with D3 that happened during uh, the, the awards show. Um, and this was quite uh, entertaining for us as we had set out to build a tool to support data analysis and scientists who sort have of inadvertently provided the foundation for Lady Gaga's Twitter tracker. <laughs> and so. And so these are just, I just want to get you a sense of the, the kind of rich expressiveness and the variety of designs that are uh, possible in visualization. Another equally important component that I won't be talking about today, but you can go to our website to learn more, is on what makes a visualization more effective. And so there's, in addition to all these tools, there's actually a rich history in statistics, applied psychology and computer science, as well as design and cartography of people trying to understand the trade-offs involved in different forms of visual representation. And I think that's also, that knowledge is an important part of the tool belt in using visualization effectively. But at this point, I'd like to move on to a slightly different topic and kind of consider the data lifecycle a bit more broadly, which is, you know, we talked about all these great visualizations, but they're really only possible when you have the data at hand. 
And really, a lot of the effort goes into all these early stages of finding the data and getting it ready. And so can we build better tools to support these early parts of data analysis? And to find out how we might do so, we actually ran an interview study. We talked with 35 different analysts at a variety of companies with job titles ranging from data scientist to analyst to CTO, and kind of got a sense of their everyday life. You know, what was their work processes like? And here's a representative quote from those interviews. I spend more than half of my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time, I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. And we heard this a lot. In fact, most people ballpark something more in the range of 70 to 80% of their time was spent in low-level tasks such as uh, you know, structuring data, transforming data between different formats, or integrating multiple data sets together, or dealing with other data quality issues. And so given the prevalence of this, not just in, in uh, industry practice, but also in research, you know, in my own field of visualization, we publish papers about new visualization techniques and then like, leave out the fact that we actually spent 60 to 80% of our time just getting the data ready to do that visual exploration. So I think of this you know, you know, as, as an interesting challenge. Even relatively clean data, this is one that comes from the US government, uh, from the Department of Justice. This is housing crime statistics. Very clean for, for human consumption, but try and feed this into a statistics package, a visualization tool, and it will break on import. You have to restructure the data in the way that the tools understand. So given all this hassle and the sort of like friction, this wasted energy, and I think of this as something of the elephant in the room of data analysis work. This is something that we're all dealing with, but for whatever reason, like, you know, rarely makes it into to our common conversations. So I think that's starting to change. So we thought, can we build tools that you know, really uh, help this process along? You know, people are either spending you know, hours like, you know, working away tediously in Excel, or writing one-off scripts in languages like Python or Perl, writing MapReduce jobs that they copy and pasted from their colleague to try and get their data into shape. Can we actually add some more structure to that process, make it more effective, but also make it more accessible to a larger audience of people who have really interesting questions about their data? And that led to a series of projects, uh, the first of which is a tool we developed at Data Wrangler. It's actually a joint project between Berkeley and Stanford, uh, primarily done by my student, Sean Candle. And so let me just jump right in and give you a demo of, of how the system works. So we start with some data that we want to clean. We might connect to a cluster, you know, an HDFS, you know, Hadoop data set, or we might upload data. In this case, for demo purposes, we'll just copy and paste a simplified version of this housing crime data to give you a sense of how this works. In any case, we connect to a data source, we click Wrangle, and this brings us into a UI where we can work with our data. And so here we have a data table here that's showing us our data. Uh, at the bottom left, we also have a history of operations. And in this case, the tool made like two assumptions for us. So one is it split the data into rows based on new lines. And then it saw the presence of like repeated commas, so it split into columns based on a comma delimiter. Of course, we could go in and undo that if we disagree, uh, but in this case, you know, it, it was the right thing to do. Now we'd like to clean up this data so we could load it into a database or a statistics or visualization package. And so there's a number of uh, cleaning steps that we need to, to do, one of which is to get rid of these empty rows. So I could go ahead and go and maybe start formulating a command based on all these verbs up here, kind of like a, a standard menu-driven system. Uh, but that's really only a last resort. Really what we want to do is have you communicate your interest in the data. So in this case, I'll just click row two. So that highlights row two, and as I select that row, the system then searches over what are the possible operations I might do with that row selection. And the first is just, okay, you selected row two, you could drop that row. Um, but the next thing you see like, in line is that we'll actually looked at the contents of that row, saw it was empty, and then secondarily suggested that you delete all empty rows. And so you can read that, and you can also then, as you, you know, select it here, see a visualization of what effect that transformation will have on your data. So in this case, this looks correct. It's going to drop the rows that are empty. So I can go ahead and hit Enter. The data updates, and this command is added to my history. You know, next, I'd like to take these pesky state names and get them associated with each of these data rows that actually have the year and a housing crime statistic. So to indicate my interest in that, I'll just go ahead and select the text Alabama. Initially, the system, one thinks I'm trying to extract text, which is correct, but starts with very simple guesses, like you're trying to extract based on the position within the string, or you want to find all instances of Alabama. Uh, and maybe I would in some other circumstances, but in this case, that's not what I want. And I can see this breaks to extract uh, you know, when extracting other state names, like Alaska is overlooked, Arkansas is cut off short, and I can see that immediately in this preview. So rather than go through all the suggestions, I can also just go ahead and um, give more examples of what I want. 
And as I give more examples, it prunes the search space of possible operations, and then the system gives a new suggestion. In this case, which is to extract the text after the word in, which is indeed what I want, and I'm able to extract out the state names into a new column. Uh, but now I still have all these missing values in this new column. And as I'm doing this, you may have noticed some, something going on along the tops of this table. So for example, here you see a little numerical icon. So Wrangler is actually looking at the data and trying to infer the underlying data type. Here it sees that most of the values are numbers, and so it flags as green the percentage of all things that parses numbers. But then in red, it shows all the things that, that don't fit that data type. Similarly, over here, it's found that this is a string value, but it has lots of missing values which are indicated in gray. So I can go ahead and click that part and then you know, get suggestions of things to do with missing values. One could be to remove them, but another is to interpolate, which in this case is just to fill or copy down all the values which fills out the cells for me. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm rapidly arriving at a much more well-structured data set, but now I have these rows that I no longer need. So I could throw away things that don't parse, you know, I could throw away things that are missing here, but each of those could be error prone. Like maybe there's a data entry error that, you know, 2004A, I'd rather fix it than throw it away. So in this case, I'd like to be very precise. And so I can go ahead and make very clear which rows I want to get rid of. So I select the text reported crime in. And when I do that, it initially thinks I'm trying to do an extraction, but I can give it a hint and just click delete. So it focuses on deletion operations, and then now it shows me all the rows that start with the text reported crime in. And indeed, these are the ones I want to delete, so I can go ahead and hit enter. And now I've arrived at a much better structured data set that I could load into a database. And I'll, I'll spare you the work of renaming all the columns, but of course we could do that as well. And now we can go down here and click export. Now that I'm done, I might export my data in a variety of formats. So common things might include comma-separated values or JavaScript object notation. And that's great if I was working with a small sample of the data, cleaned it up, and now I have all the data I need to take out of the tool. But in many cases, we're dealing with data sets that are much larger than what we could put into an interactive tool like this. So what we do instead is actually we can connect to a data set and take a sample. So just, you know, you know not all of the data, but, but a subsample, and use that to try and figure out the transformation operations. And so, of course, we have this history down here of all the operations that we've done. These are actually just representations of, sta of statements in a programming language of our own design. So we actually have our own high-level language called Wrangle for doing data transformation tasks. And each one of these things is just uh, you know, a natural text rendering of that statement. So we can take that program that we generated interactively and then actually compile it into a common language. So for example, rather than get the data, I can have this tool automatically generate the Python program that could clean up this data set at scale. So one of the things that we can do then is like, you know, take in a sample of data, clean it up, and then generate programs that we can then try and send back to the server to run at larger scales. And we can do this for a variety of languages. Here it was in Python. We've also done things for SQL, JavaScript. We've also built things that uh, talk to Hadoop clusters to run MapReduce jobs over large unstructured data sets. So in this way, we're trying to take this effort of programming and turn it into a much more interactive and visual experience. So just to, to briefly recap and give you a sense of how that works, you know, Wrangler is really built out of two pieces. So again, underneath the hood, we have our own programming language for data transformation, uh, which you know, encompasses a number of really common operations. So all the types of things you would normally do in SQL, plus commands for reshaping data tables or doing lookup tables. So for example, if I given a state name, I wanted to know the lat long centroid, those are the types of data type operations we could plug in easily to the language. We then combine that with this user interface, where the, the real primary interaction model is what we call mixed initiative interaction. That is like both the system and the person work together to try and craft the result. So in this case, the user selects data elements of interest to them. The system suggests in response applicable transforms by searching over statements in this underlying language. We then have both a set of hand-coded heuristics, but also a big corpus of data sets that we've transformed. So we can learn from the statistics of all those transformations to help provide better suggestions within the UI. And one of the things that we found in user studies is that these visual previews in particular were critical, and that by looking at the visualization of how the data would change if this operator were applied was the primary means by which people made their decisions on how to progress in working with their data. And so as I alluded to, we did run a user study. Um, and as a starting point, we compared with Excel, because by our estimation, this is by far the most common like, data transformation and manipulation tool used today. To make the comparison fair, we actually started with a small data set, something that was actually amenable to manual transformation in Excel. 
and then explored you know, people's performance with both Wrangler and Excel, many of whom were actually Excel experts, uh, doing common data cleaning tasks like extracting values from strings, imputing missing values, or reshaping tables. So for example, taking a, a large matrix or cross tab and mapping that into a more standard relational database table. We then gave them these tasks, of course looked at their, their response time to successfully complete the task, um, and then we were able to observe the results. And in this case, what we found was that even for this very small data set, on median, people were at least twice as fast in Wrangler. This was statistically significant. And perhaps more interestingly, we got a lot of qualitative insights into how with this combination of um, kind of reactive suggestions and visual previews work together to let people explore the space of data transformations. So this is one part, I think, at least one step forward in this problem of trying to make these early stages of working with data when it's, kind of, it's the most messy and the most time consuming a little bit easier. You know, the next project I want to briefly share with you kind of looks at the very next step. Once we've cleaned up that data, at least into a relatively reasonable structure, what are all the other types of errors that may be lurking in wait? And so in this case, we see on the left, you know, just a list of variables. This is actually data about motion pictures. So different films, like their IMDb rating, their production budget, the title, the director, et cetera. Um, and then uh, below that, we actually have a set of identified anomalies. So again, we have variables for which we've uh, inferred their data type. And then we run a set of statistical routines across the data to try and identify common forms of error or anomaly, including a prevalence for missing values, extreme outliers, you know, inconsistencies across fields, possible duplicates, things of that nature. And so then what we do is, you know, these are very common techniques. We want to make them available and accessible in a relatively easy to use interface. So in this case, we can go in and look at the, you know, variables with high degree of missing values. We see MPA rating, for example, whether it's G, PG13, R, et cetera, has a lot of missing values. So one of the things we might naturally want to do is actually visualize that distribution. So here's just one simple chart that shows you the prevalence of the different ratings. But above it, we again have this quality bar as we saw in Wrangler, where we see about 20% of the data, in this case shown in green, is actually missing. And while it's useful to know that this is missing perhaps, you know, it's not very useful in helping understand the cause of this problem. You know, what might be at play that's you know, resulting in missing values here? So the main idea in this system we call Profiler is, you know, once we've identified these anomalies, can we automatically suggest visualizations that help put those anomalies in context? So if you clicked on MPA rating in the actual tool, what you would get is actually this display here, where it shows you MPA rating, but it's actually done an analysis that says, for all the other variables and also some possible transformations of those variables, which best predicts the distribution of missing values seen? And so again, we can use this technique I showed you earlier of brushing and linking. In this case, if I click the missing values, I see how they distribute across all the other charts in this display. And the, the, the number one top recommended chart here is actually release date, which the system has chosen to group by year. And so what you see is that for all of the older movies up to about 1968, they're all missing their MPA rating. And if you go dig in, unsurprisingly, this is when MPA ratings became required for films. So this allows you to triage. You might say, okay, I don't think these are erroneous values, but now for all of these movies that are missing ratings in more recent years, maybe I want to dig in and understand those better. So in this way, I, again, using this sort of mixed initiative approach of trying to leverage what this computer can do well and what the human can do well together to try and get through this process of assessing the quality and the trustworthiness of your data. I also mentioned that we've taken these, these products, these, these projects, both Wrangler and Profile and others, and actually started a company called Trifacta where we're beginning to commercialize them. So hopefully, uh, certainly in the next couple months, if not the next year, look soon for, for, for more tools of this sort. But finally, I want to kind of look further afield uh, within this process. We've talked about visualization. We've talked about these early stages of data cleaning and quality assessment. And then looking forward to the role that visualization can play, perhaps hand in hand with more traditional statistical methods as well. And in this area, I want to just give you a, a brief tour of one project we did at Stanford called the Stanford Dissertation Browser. And this was a collaboration with folks in sociology and natural language processing uh, with us in the visualization group. Um, and the overarching motivation was we were actually tasked by President John Hennessy of Stanford to try and assess the, you know, the outputs of different interdisciplinary projects at Stanford. So for example, when the administration puts hundreds of millions of dollars into building up a new center with new buildings, et cetera, does that have measurable impacts in the academic output? And there's various ways you can look at that. So certainly one is in, in the form of citation graphs, of grants, et cetera. You can look at other you know, uh, measures of collaboration. In this case, what folks were interested in was, like, well, does it actually affect the content of the work, the research work being produced? 
So in this case, it really was a text mining question. And what we did was take 20 years of Stanford PhD dissertations, you know, kind of collect them all under their, their parent departments, and see if we can assess shifting similarities in the text produced by these departments over time. So really it's this question like how similar or different are these departments based on the text they produce? And so we approach this, you know, there's a lot of different um, you know, existing similarity measures you can use for text. Some of you may be familiar with TF-IDF or cosine similarity, common ways of turning text into multidimensional vectors and comparing them. There's also more sophisticated statistical techniques, in particular topo topic modeling algorithms, which then try to take all the words and then kind of project them onto a lower dimensional space that rather than representing text as words, try in some sense capture recurring themes or topics within the text and then compare the similarity amongst different documents uh, using that representation. So we thought we'd explore those a bit, but, but we thought coming into this that what we'd end up doing is spending a lot of time iterating on the visualization design till we found something that both was suitable to our collaborators who have a lot of expertise in the algorithms, but was approachable to the, the general university population. But instead what happened actually, funny enough, was we, we arrived at a visualization that very quickly taught us that the models were all wrong. Um, and the visualization we used here is in this case you have a single department in the center, computer science, and then on the outer radius you have all the other departments, and you see radially their distance to the other departments. And then we can try and assess, well, what makes these, these different departments related or unrelated to each other, so we can populate some individual theses here and explore them. And so we started with this, and this allowed us to really look at fine-grained similarities uh, amongst uh, different departments, as well as under different models. And so, for example, one of the models we started with was like a, kind of a state-of-the-art topic model. It's called latent Dirichlet allocation. We applied it using a state-of-the-art methods for picking the right number of topics uh, within, the, within the model. And we ended up with this display, which says that all of the humanities are really undifferentiated. <laughs> and so all the humanities were collapsed into a single topic here. And now, now, given our analysis goals, we knew this was sort of a priori wrong. Like, we actually wanted to understand interesting separations amongst the humanities. In addition, as an untenured professor, I felt this graphic was, you know, politically quite dangerous for me. <laughs> um, so what can we do? But what we found is actually, you know, we actually ended up creating this visualization in response where we went in and see, well, what theses are driving this similarity? Um, this also then provided a way that we could share the visualization with other domain experts, so both graduate students and professors, and actually collect their annotations. Like, which things is the system doing right? Which things are doing wrong? Trying to build up a model of their domain expertise as well. And A, that helped us, you know, kind of create, you know, a, a simple benchmark for trying to understand how well the model reflects people's understanding of the university. But in the, in the process, it also sparked conversations that actually sent us to somewhere a little bit deeper. And we realized a fundamental assumption shared by all of our models was wrong. And that is that we should measure the similarity between departments um, using you know, a standard distance metric. One feature of which is that it is symmetric. That is, the distance from A to B is the same as the distance from B to A. And that might seem like a natural thing to do, but it turns out when you talk about this type of data, people, it turns out, don't think that way. So here's one example of that um, um, reflected using an updated model that takes this, this idea into account. Um, so on the left you see computer science and it's in the center and on the right you have the music department at Stanford. And this is really interesting because there's basically almost no audio or musical research at all conducted within the computer science department at Stanford. However, many of you are probably familiar with Karma, which is part of the music department at Stanford. It does amazing work in digital audio and music. And so this way you have people saying things like, computer science is not similar to the music department, but the music department is similar to the computer science department. And so what we ended up doing is like we actually took that idea and fit a way, we basically learned a word distribution model for each department separately. And then we had this additional metric of like, how does one department's theses borrow words from the distribution of these other departments? And use that to actually form an asymmetric affinity score, which we can then also show using this same visualization. So the visualization was nice because we actually punch in lots of different models and see the effects. So in this case, we see with our improved model based on word borrowing, you know, again, you know, music is somewhat distant to computer science, which, for example, is much closer in this case to electrical engineering. But then when the tables are turned, you see actually computer science uh, shows up as the most similar department uh, to music. And so there are other examples of projects in this vein that we've been doing at Stanford. But here I just want to stop and use this sort of as an example. Uh, we, the other thing that we found, of course, is that uh, people actually find this fun. So here's people on the Discovery blog actually exploring relationships between different scientific disciplines using the tool. And it's online if you want to go play with it. <laughs>
But more broadly, I think this points to this really interesting intersection of how human uh, supervision and insight is incorporated into these analysis processes. And I think text in particular is a really rich area for this because at a much more fundamental level, our interpretation of text is subjective in ways that perhaps other forms of data might be less so. Um, but understanding the role of visualization, modeling, and exploration together, I think, um, is a really uh, exciting area for continued interdisciplinary work. And so in this talk, I hope I've convinced you that there are a number of interesting opportunities, not just in any one siloed area, but up and down the, the life cycle of data analysis and really understanding the important bottlenecks and challenges that we face when we think about data analysis as a sort of integrated process of going from raw materials to making decisions. So with that, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators and students um, who are obviously uh, responsible for the lion's share of, of the work you saw today. Um, also, thank you uh, for your attention and let you know that oh, lots of papers, uh, open source software, et cetera, are available online and you can start it at this URL. So thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah, in the back. This is great, yes. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question about whether it's possible in this analysis to get a sense of what you might call valence or gravitational pull between different kinds of things that are related. So, for example, in chemistry and in, in physics and even in social psychology, when Kurt Lewin was talking about valences, about what attract and repel certain people from certain interactions, there's a sense of dynamism mm -hmm. that you don't get from just a static representation. So um, sure. I'm wondering, and, and I was thinking about this as I was looking at the dissertation stuff, so it's kind of like a solar system kind of thing. Jupiter obviously pulls a lot stronger, mm -hmm. you know, than some other planet that's very, very tiny. So how do you guys think about that, or do you? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of interesting points there. Um, just to, to be up front, I tend to be somewhat skeptical of, of, of metaphors. I find them useful you know, uh, you know, have fonts of inspiration, but you know, if you take them so far, you end up in false entailments quite quickly. As you know, given given Lakoff's presence here, Berkeley folks know this quite well. Um, but I think there's an interesting point about dynamism. One of the things I didn't show in these examples was actually we you had the model that actually shifted over time. So actually, in this case, we used animation. You could also imagine using line charts or other things to actually show the dynamics of, of these similarities over time. And I think for any of these things, we oftentimes, you know, for either because of uh, resource constraints or just you know, limited access to data, we end up with these sort of synoptic snapshots of data. But where we can get into the dynamics of data is obviously extremely interesting and you know, very fertile ground. Um, so, <clears throat> D3, the, 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 all of the examples and visualizations that I've seen with D3 are beautiful and very impressive. You guys have done a terrific job there. But for these to become kind of part of the everyday toolkit of working scientists who are doing interactive, sure. iterative uh, analysis with, with raw data, um, it still feels a little bit low level. And Absolutely. it feels sort of like the, the assembly language of graphics, and there's kind of a, a missing layer that expresses higher level, I don't know, maybe something along the lines of the grammar of graphics of the ggplot machinery yep, yep, yep. or other types of APIs. Are you guys working on in, in that direction? Is, has any sure. major progress been done on that front? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. So again, when we started D3, actually the way uh, Mike Bostock originally, like, uh, talked about it was as a kernel for visualization. Kind of what is like the you know we actually it's much higher level than things like a graphics library, for example, right? So it, get, it gets you and it has a lot of notion of visualization design built in. So it does give you a bunch of mileage. But I absolutely agree that if you're a scientist at the workbench, you know writing JavaScript code is probably not the best use of your time. You could probably get better tools. So some of those that are out there are things like you mentioned uh, Wilkinson's Grammar of Graphics, which is also then uh, Hadley Wickham built a version of that called ggplot2, which is a plugin for R, which is very popular and I highly recommend it for you know, creating um, you know, graphics sort of on the fly with like, much less coding. There's also um, commercial tools like Tableau, um, who had a very successful IPO a week or two ago. Um, that you might look at. And all of these actually have like a higher level model of visualization which actually layers quite nicely on top of the things D3 does. So we really see it as actually beginning to build up the, the, the appropriate stack of representations for visual representation. And you're absolutely right that D3 uh, has a role to play, it's just it's lower in that stack. Um, at, actually, at Trifacta, we recently released an open source library called Vega, which is basically a grammar of graphics in, uh, in JSON. So it's a personal representation for then generating graphics. And basically trying, it's not very glamorous stuff, it's actually just what's a good file format for visualization so that you can share visualizations effectively and then build tools on top of that that allow for interactive design 
and really looking at that problem of how do we turn visualization design into a programming exercise into really more an interactive design exercise. Something that we're really passionate about and just starting some research on. I actually have a student named Arvin Sachinarayan who's like making this the focus of his PhD dissertation. Um, so that works ongoing, but I'm hoping it will bear really interesting fruit. Um, and just in closing, I had mentioned, maybe many of you have seen this, uh, Brett Victor, who's an amazing designer recently, he actually gave a talk at Stanford, and the video's online now, for a thing we call drawing uh, dynamic data visualization. So if you want to see one other approach to possibly making data visualization design interactive, uh, I recommend go checking out his talk. Fantastic talk. I just saw yeah. it video. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, I have one question about the data profiler. Sure. which uh, detects the data and the uh, incomplete data, et cetera. Can you make it even a close loop by like uh, uh, summarize all those in, uh, inaccuracies and actually give the feedback back to the data source so that they can fix the problem in a source than other people who don't use your software, but mm -hmm. they will get more accurate data afterwards when people use your software to detect the incom incomplete information or uh, inaccuracy, the source of the data, the people actually correct them. Right, right. So we haven't had a sufficient deployment of that particular tool to have like any kind of lessons learned for me to share today. But I think that's a fantastic suggestion. I mean, I absolutely believe that. I mean, part of the value of surfing these things is not just to fix the data now. Yeah. But that's actually very much needed. Like, yeah, you know, if I have to wait two weeks to complete some analysis, it might never happen if I need to make a business decision, you know, two days from now. So I think these stopgap tools are necessary, but I, I absolutely agree that in the larger ecosystem, they have a role to play in providing you know, data back to the people responsible for, for data collection and curation as well. Um, these are some of the things that we hope to you know, address uh, more fully as we go forward uh, in the form of our company. Uh, it seems like that's the, the right venue in which to start to address those things. I think research is at more of a disadvantage in really getting into to people's existing processes there. Great talk, longtime admirer of your work. Thank you. Um, wondering if you could talk a little bit about Data Wrangler and the process you guys took to identify, you know, what are the most important features to build, what right. are the most common workflows that we want to enable. How did you guys gather that data and approach um, that process? So, so we had a ringer in the form that uh, one of our collaborators, as Joe Hellerstein, a database professor here at Berkeley, so he actually did this really interesting system over ten years ago now called Potter's Wheel which was like, uh, similarly an idea was, can we have an interactive system for doing data cleaning? And it was more of a menu driven type system. I think one of the things that we really explored with Wrangler was how can we make better suggestions, really reduce the, the articulatory distance of getting these transformations and then helping people understand the effects. Um, so some of this has actually been already researched in the database literature. There's actually variants, like kind of supersets of the SQL, you know, structured query language for databases, one called Schema SQL, that actually provided a base for, for, uh, for Potter's Wheel as well as for our own work. And that's actually complete with a bunch of stuff, including various proofs of the expressivity of the language. So some of that's formal. And other parts of it are just come out of practice. So, um, you know, do you kind of like, you build up test cases, as it were, with lots and lots of different data sets to get a sense of what it's good for. Um, and so what we found was we actually ended up having this sort of iterative co-design process is that as we designed features in the user interface, we ended up, you know, incorporating new features in the language and vice versa. So they really grew together. One of the really interesting things that came out of that process was that initially our goal was let's figure out a small set of verbs and then come up with some kind of interactive gestures for each. So the idea was like less, you know, kind of machine learning driven and more just like let's get this like super user interface. But it turned out as we played with data, a lot of the things people wanted to do were really ambiguous. Like I select this text. Well, it could mean one of three things, not just one obvious thing. The nice part, though, is it only meant like one of three or one of five things and not one of a hundred things, which then they kind of cued us into the fact that this suggestion model might work. Because basically, you know, you, you give a hint and then you do a little bit of work to disambiguate what the person's trying to do. And the domain was such that that ended up working quite nicely. An interesting question for future research I don't know the answer to yet is like, how well does that strategy work in other domains? I mean, things where that you can structure the, the operations in a really tight, uh, relatively small number of verb, you know, domain-specific language, you might be able to get away with it. But with other things where the types of operations may be, you know, in the hundreds or thousands, it might be much more difficult to try and, you know, reapply this strategy. Thank I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.